So we go to the second paper, uh, which will be presented by Dimitri Cebotarev from INSEAD, and it's the paradox of conservative haircuts. Thank you very much to the organizers for putting my paper on the program. I'm going to talk about the paradox of conservative haircuts, and it also happens to be my job market paper. And therefore, all comments, questions, and especially critiques are more than welcome. So this will be a paper about how the collateral requirements of central counterparties affect the selection of participants in the centrally cleared market. And since there hasn't been too big a discussion about central counterparties today, let me quickly introduce what that is. So CCPs are financial intermediaries, special financial intermediaries that exist to address the counterparty risk in financial markets. So imagine that uh, there is a bilateral deal. If one counterparty defaults, the other is, of course, affected. By contrast, if there is a centrally clear transaction, the CCP arises and separates the initial transaction into two back-to-back -back deals, each done with the CCP itself. Then, if, as previously, one uh, counterparty defaults, the other is not affected. Of course, provided that the CCP itself is resilient. Now, if we imagine several deals going through the CCP, then it will become apparent that the CCP concentrates risks and therefore becomes systemically important. And this is especially a crucial issue now when centralized clearing is spreading across contract types and geographically. So if we ask the question empirically, are CCPs financially stable, then we will see that the evidence, empirical evidence at least, is a bit mixed. On the one hand, we have papers that show the examples when the CCP um, was uh, acting as a shock absorber in a stressed market or uh, helped to avoid fire sales. But we also have cases when the probability of default of the CCP was priced sufficiently high to be, no, to be noticeable in the repo rates, or we have documented cases of defaults of CCPs. So it is pivotal to understand how well CCPs are protected by their risk management system, given their central position to many markets. And if we look at uh, the risk management system of CCPs, it will turn out that they are fairly complicated. They have multi uh, layer structure. First of all, the individual collateral, that is, my collateral, can be, uh, which can be used only to cover losses inflicted by my own actions. By contrast, the guarantee fund, the second pillar of uh, this risk management system, works as a risk mutualization device. My contribution to the uh, guarantee fund can be used to cover the losses triggered by actions of other traders. And finally, there is the dedicated capital of the CCP, also known as skin in the game. Since the story will be chiefly about the first component, the individual collateral, it is important to know what is the common understanding of its role. Uh, typically, it is assumed that the more collateral the CCP requires, the more incentive it gives to the market participants not to default and the higher the coverage is. That is, if the market participant defaults, the CCP liquidates the collateral and covers the loss. Therefore, the more collateral, the higher the CCP stability. The question that I'm going, going to ask here is whether this effect is unconditional, which means whether it is always the case that high collateral requirement benefit the CCP stability. And I will try to answer this question negatively. I'll try to show that high collateral requirements can, in fact, push the best traders out of the CCP market which can affect the guarantee fund, which works as an insurance. Imagine if we push the best agents out of the insurance, the quality of the insurance deteriorates. But how can this happen? So imagine that there are two markets, the centrally cleared and the over-the-counter. And there is a set of agents which can choose uh, where to trade. Also suppose that there is some initial allocation everyone to the right of the red line go to the OTC and all to the, or on to the left go to the CCP. Now, one of the biggest differences between these two markets is that in the OTC market, everything is negotiable bilaterally. We can negotiate the collateral constraint, the pro, uh, we can negotiate the collateral um, 
the how the collateral requirements, uh, how big the collateral requirements are, the price, the term, everything. In the CCP market, usually margining, usually the collateral requirement is set on a uniform level for everyone. It, it is not negotiable. Imagine that the CCP exogenously decides to increase the collateral requirement. What will happen is that those who trade in the CCP market will be affected. For them, the trading costs will increase. Then some of them will probably want to switch to the OTC market, and probably some of them actually will. So the question of the effect of this change in collateral requirement on, uh, the, mm, on the CCP market, uh, in my case, will be Will, will boil down to how different these green switchers are from the blue who stayed in the market. In this paper, I'm going to argue that those who switch are the participants who have the highest credit quality. Therefore, after the change, the quality of the pool of traders in the CCP market deteriorates. To show this, I will use the data set from Moscow Exchange, which will be the data set on repo deals, both centrally cleared and over the counter. Using this data, I will establish three lines of result. First of all, I'll make a statement about how the collateral, uh, how the credit quality of uh, the borrowers in the repo market affect the position on their, of, of this red line. More precisely, of the position of the borrowers with respect to this, to this red line. I will show that risky borrowers are more likely to borrow in the centrally cleared market, and further that it is the lender's risk preferences that affect the borrower's allocation. The idea is that if you are a risk-averse lender and you are faced by uh, by good and uh, like by risky and safe borrowers, and you observe their credit quality you are more likely to trade bilaterally in the OTC market, that is, to take the risk bilaterally um, with the, uh, on the, the high-quality borrowers. And you will give more incentive to the risky borrowers to go and buy an insurance to decrease the reducing credit risk, for example, through trading through the CCP. Then the next result is that the higher CCP collateral requirement induce safer borrowers to trade over the counter. I will show that the quality of the blue plus green pool of traders is higher than the quality of just the blue in terms of the credit risk. And finally, a result that I will not uh, devote time today, unfortunately, uh, due to the time restrictions, is that there is a shade, uh, there, is, there are different shades of this effect, uh, which depends on how collateral constrained the borrowers are. Imagine that I'm a bank, that have some um, some stock of collateral, and yesterday I already pledged it to the lender. Then, if today the lender increases the collateral requirement, uh, which uh, in uh, terms of this paper I will proxy by the haircut, if the haircut increases, it mechanically decreases the amount of money that I can borrow against the same fixed amount of collateral. By contrast, another bank that has some unencumbered collateral and a reasonably low cost of pledging additional collateral to the lender will be much less affected by this change in collateral requirement. Therefore, the degree by which this uniform increase in collateral requirements by the CCP will affect the borrowers depends on the degree of collateral constraint, which of course will interact with this main effect. All right. The literature that I relate to is, first of all, of course, literature on centralized clearing. Uh, of course, this is the empirical literature on the stability of CCPs, which is quite thin due to uh, the low availability of the data, and also to the theoretical literature, especially the latest ones on uh, the design of, uh, uh, of design of the risk management system of CCPs. Since the paper is a selection paper, uh, I'm talking about this, the selection of the borrowers between the CCP and OTC market. Of course, I relate to the literature on uh, the endogenous selection, endogenous market selection between the centralized market and the over-the-counter market. By contrast to the main part of the literature, my paper is first of all empirical, and secondly has 
even for empirical papers, has quite a, a peculiar data set. In Russia, in the uh, in the repo market, the CCP is not very picky, at least in the interbank segment, with admitting uh, traders to um, to the centralized clearing. That is, it uh, thinks that if it is a bank, it is supervised by the Central Bank of Russia, therefore it is a safe member. By contrast, in the Europe, at least in terms of repo, it is quite hard to get access to, to the centralized clearing. This will allow me to um, sort of look at this selection effect without thinking of what is the role of uh, being or not admitted due to uh, high entrance barriers in the CCP market. The starting point for the paper is the regulator and practical literature. Uh, for example, the principles for financial market uh, infrastructures, which um, discuss, uh, which has a discussion about uh, the procyclicality and suggests that uh, collateral requirements should be high throughout the cycle, not to increase them in the downturn of the market. And there is very little discussion typically in the regulatory literature about what is the cost of high collateral requirements. So my paper is trying to suggest some uh, some cost to this. And of course, since it is a paper on repo, I am related to uh, the discussion on the stability of different segments of the repo market. The data that I'm using comes mostly from the Moscow exchange. It is individual deal level data. Uh, from January 2013 to July 2016, I see who is trading with whom, what is the haircut, rate, date, what collateral is, what the loan amount, um, so basically everything. I can match this with the data on the uh, balance sheet of banks, which I get from the Central Bank of Russia, and uh, I get the historical credit rating ratings by uh, web scrapping a practitioner's web page. Uh, in general, the data set is comprised of the OTC market, and the centrally cleared market. Centrally cleared market is not uniform. It has two blocks. Bil bilateral CCP deals are very similar to the OTC. As in the OTC market, first lender and the borrower communicate either on the phone or through the terminal, but then they decide to tick the box that the deal should be centrally cleared. Then it is the CCP who chooses the effective size of collateral requirement. By contrast, the exchange traded uh, repo uh, in the centrally cleared market is implemented as a limit order book where the collateral requirement is preset and the interest rate is um, determined by uh, just by supply and demand. Um, the most of the data is coming uh, is in the OTC market, which is due to uh, to the timing of the sample. My sample starts when the CCP market is almost non-existent and then it takes uh, it, it bites pieces from the OTC market throughout the sample. So if we compare unconditionally uh, the OTC and CCP market, we will see that uh, uh, that the haircuts in the CCP market unconditionally, so it's over all borrowers, lenders, and collateral, uh, haircuts in the CCP markets are higher, and the repo rate is lower. The lenders and the borrowers both in the OTC market are bigger, and uh, most importantly for us, unconditionally again, the credit risk in the OTC market is lower than in the CCP. But what do I mean by saying credit risk? By that I mean uh, the latest credit rating by Moody's, S&P or Pitch converted to the Moody's rating scale to which I assign points from 1 being the safest to 13 or 14 uh, being the most risky. Okay. So let's go to uh, to the results and first of all uh, discuss the uh, how the collateral how the the credit quality of the borrowers affect where uh, the borrower is going to uh, to trade in the CCP or OTC market. But if we think about it, how the effect how if we think about how um, the credit risk affects the allocation of borrowers, it is not very clear exactly what we would expect. One way to look at it before we see the result is to think about it in terms of the degree of information asymmetry. If, uh, if uh, the lenders have little information about uh, the quality of the borrowers, we can think about it in terms of Bester 85 paper, where CCP is a costly signal. So uh, endogenously, collateral is more uh, is uh, um, pricey, it's more costly 
for risky borrowers, and therefore a separating equilibrium may, may exist in which safe borrowers separate themselves by offering more collateral. Since the CCP intuitively has uh, some advantage at managing high amounts of collateral, there can be there can exist an equilibrium in which CCP asks more collateral, and the best borrowers separate themselves by uh, taking this contract, and therefore getting lower lower repo rate. By contrast, if there is not too much information asymmetry, for example, if ratings are uh, sufficiently informative, one can think about the CCP playing the role of an insurance device or an insurance company. If lenders are risk averse, then uh, one would expect uh, one would expect uh, the insurance, which is the CCP, to be more uh, more useful for riskier borrowers. So the lenders will uh, will trade with the uh, safe borrowers over the counter and give the incentive to uh, to the risky borrowers to go and insure themselves through the CCP. Then it is the risky borrowers that will turn out to borrow through the CCP. If we look at their empirical results, we will see that uh, they are in fact consistent with the latter uh, with the latter hypothesis, which means that the CCP plays the role of an insurance company. The higher the credit risk of uh, the borrower, the more likely this borrower is to trade in the centrally cleared market. This um, this is yeah this is in line with letter hypothesis, but also I show some evidence in the paper that this effect has something to do with the lender's risk preferences. First of all, this effect is strongest for the non-anonymous or the bilateral market in which the uh, the lender have more information about the quality of uh, the quality of the borrower. As practitioners explained to me, uh, when the borrower and the lender contact, for example, on the, on the phone, it is not clear yet where they are going to trade. And after discussing all the details of the deal, it may be that the lender will say, OK, we will do it, but please let's do it in the centrally cleared market. So this there is this um, um, this amplification of the selection effect. We uh, we will expect the selection between the OTC and bilateral CCP to be stronger than between OTC and and uh, uh, exchange traded CCP, and this is exactly what we find. Another evidence uh, that uh, another evidence suggesting that there is something to do, uh, there is something to do with the uh, with the lenders' risk aversion is that the effect of credit rating, the effect of credit risk. It decays with the age of the credit rating. This is in line with understanding that uh, that the uh, credit rating is a noisy signal about the borrower's credit quality. Then, if the credit rating was released yesterday, it's much more informative about the state of my balance sheet than if it was released a year ago. This is in line with the lender looking at the credit rating and uh, making a decision about whether to trade or not with this uh, with this borrower over the counter or what rate and haircut how to negotiate the rate and haircut with this particular borrower to wrap up this part i show that risky borrowers are more likely to borrow in the ccp repo market and that this in general this story is in line with the ccp playing the role of an insurance uh, of an insurance company and um, and uh, uh, the selection being influenced by the lender's risk preferences, by their uh, risk aversion. Now, going to uh, to the main result, just to um, to remind you, uh, here I'm going to argue that uh, that the collateral requirements of the CCP affect the selection of borrowers. That is, high collateral requirement of the CCP will push the best borrowers out of the centrally cleared market. How am I going to do this? For identification, I'm going to use the difference in haircuts between the centrally cleared and over-the-counter repo markets. The idea is very simple. CCP haircuts are collateral specific. How do I know this? Well, this, the CCP, uh, the CCP in, on the, of the Moscow Exchange has a methodology that is published on its webpage. And according to this methodology, 
uh, it does not take into account the identity of the borrowers or lenders or anyone else. By contrast, the OTC market does not even have a unified methodology. So the average haircut in the OTC market, uh, it is sort of a decentralized view of the market on how what, what the collateral requirement at this point in time for this security should be. And uh, uh, of course, both haircuts in the CCP and OTC market are sensitive to the uh, security specific events, but they react in different ways. CCP reacts in a predefined way and the OTC uh, and the OTC doesn't. The OTC can react to different events or can react to the same events in a different way. Therefore, I'm using the difference between these haircuts as a measure of overreaction of the CCP to security specific news. I start by aggregating the credit risk and the haircut at the collateral month level in each market. And then I run a regression, first starting the regression of difference in credit risk between the two markets on the difference in haircut between the two markets, of course, with security and month fixed effects. And uh, first, I find that, uh, um, that uh, the coefficient is positive and significant, which uh, is in line so far with the idea that a high collateral requirement in the CCP market leading to a high credit risk in the CCP market. But we don't know yet whether this effect comes from the CCP haircut or OTC haircut. To, to know this, let us decompose the exogenous variable. By doing so, we see that uh, the effect is indeed coming from the centrally cleared market. Uh, further, we can support this by uh, univariate regressions. Yet, the endogenous variable is uh, still the difference in credit risk. We don't know whether it is coming, whether the effect is going through the credit risk in the CCP market or the OTC. This can be shown by decomposing the endogenous variable as well. And here we see that indeed when the haircut in the CCP market goes up, the credit risk in the CCP market goes up as well. By contrast, in the OTC market, the, hair, uh, the credit risk goes down in response to an increase in the CCP haircut, which is in line with, uh, uh, with uh, less risky borrowers going from the CCP into the OTC market, which decomposes uh, the column two on the previous in the previous table, and uh, of course we can uh, obtain the same results uh, with the, the previous endogenous variable, the haircut difference. Here, if we think about the economic significance, it will turn out that it is quite modest. This coefficient, for example, says that it takes a difference in haircuts between the two markets of twenty percentage points to move the credit risk difference by one point. This is kind of a lot, but uh, remember that in these regressions, this, uh, this difference is, is, is composed of two parts, the CCP and the OTC. So first of all, all the noise in the OTC haircuts uh, that come from the variation we're not very much interested in, it goes into this, into this measurement and uh, it uh, can affect uh, the estimate as the uh, as uh, the measurement error in the exogenous variable um, leading to an attenuation bias. So, ideally, we would we would like to look at an experiment when the CCP moves the haircut exogenously, and the OTC doesn't uh, doesn't react to this, so that with the haircut difference moves only due to the CCP. Uh, to the action of the CCP. Not having this as, a, as, a, an, as an experiment, let's try to get to it as close as possible. So imagine that, uh, uh, that the OTC haircut is composed of two parts. One is common with the CCP haircut and the other is orthogonal. Then, of course, the haircut difference will also have the same structure. By regressing, the haircut difference on the CCP haircut will identify the correlation, which turns out to be roughly 40%. Now, if we regress the credit risk in, uh, in each of the markets and the credit risk difference as well, on the estimated haircut difference, that is on this component, 
This will be, uh, first of all, we will throw out uh, the noise coming from the OTC market. For example, uh, when the OTC haircut changed, but the CCP haircut did not move. And also we will, uh, we will sort of get close to this idea that the CCP, uh, the CCP changed the haircut, but the OTC did not change the haircut. We're kind of undoing the reaction of the, OT, uh, of the OTC market to this component present in the CCP haircut. By doing so, um, we will find that now the credit risk difference is more sensitive to, uh, to the haircut difference. It takes roughly a five percentage point uh, hair, uh, difference in haircut to move the credit risk difference by one, by one point. Now, uh, let me let me summarize these findings. So first of all, there is the, the main the main takeaways are that there is the selection effect, that the collateral requirements of the CCP induce the selection effect, and that it has something to do with collateral constraint. It is amplified by the collateral constraint, but the direction of this effect depends on the institutional characteristics, not only of the centrally cleared market, but also of the market into which the selection is going. For example, if in the OTC market, the lenders were not that sensitive to, uh, to the credit risk, then, the, uh, then this effect would not be correlated with the credit risk. Then the, um, the safest borrowers would not be more flexible in switching the market. Okay, so every time we're thinking about the selection, we need to identify what is the alternative contract and to compare the institutional details of the two. Can this effect be first order rather than second order? Because of course, that's what we started with. When the CCP increases the haircut, it gets more collateral. Therefore, it should be more stable. I would like so far at this point to leave it as an open question because this requires a model and uh, in fact, I have a model in my paper. It's in the it's in the appendix. Uh, it still has some uh, some things uh, to to be changed. Uh, in this, this is a model of market selection where the contract in the OTC market is endogenous, and in CCP market is exogenous. In this model, I show uh, an example of the situation when the CCP increases the collateral requirement, and at some point, the if the effect of selection becomes stronger then the first order effect of uh, mm, then the direct effect of uh, uh, just uh, having more collateral and therefore becoming more resilient. Um, but uh, uh, it, it still has to be calibrated and uh, yeah. And uh, uh, this of course has uh, uh, implications for, uh, for the regulatory policy. And so first of all, it gives, uh, it provides some um, some justification, some uh, additional reasons for the uh, mandatory central uh, centralized clearing of uh, uh, the standardized derivatives, and uh, uh, some motivation for the regulation of collateral requirements in the OTC market. But uh, we need to know that this is not uh, th this is unlikely to solve the issue completely because there is a very nice paper by Stefano Ungaro who analyzes, um, who analyzes the introduction of the CCP uh, in France in the beginning of the 20th century and shows that uh, when, uh, when the CCP collateral requirements were high and, uh, mm, and, uh, um, clear, and centralized clearing of, certain, of, uh, of repo with certain collateral was mandatory, it gave actually rise to another market which was legally different from repo, but economically similar. So the Sorry, Dimitri, may I ask you to wrap up because I don't want to dance in the, the discussant time. Sorry. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, that's it. Uh, I uh, yeah, thank you very much for um, uh, for giving me uh, the opportunity to present here, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the discussant is Wen Pan Wang uh, from the BAS. Thanks again uh, for having me discussing uh, this interesting paper. Uh, so uh, my name is Wen Huang from the BAS. So the usual disclaimer applies. 
uh, the views expressed here are all mine and not necessarily of the BIS. Um, so yeah, so first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Vinitrix for this nice paper. Uh, I think you have a lot of interesting results, um, and uh, yeah, and uh, just and I think you did a great job in uh, presenting the results as well. Uh, but just to give a high level summary, uh, so the paper studies the impact of uh, uniform cholesterol haircuts of CCP uh, in the uh, of on the on the clearing incentives. And uh, Dimitri has already uh, showed that uh, you know he has a very uh, novel trade level data on interbank ruble ripple from uh, Moscow exchange. And uh, the paper shows that when CCP raised a uh, haircut, uh, it actually can push away the low risk borrowers. And uh, this effect is particularly strong for those ones uh, with uh, binding funding constraints. So in other words, uh, the CCP was uh, ever selected. And then as uh, Dimitri mentioned in the appendix, the author shows a theory model that uh, such effect uh, could potentially impair CCP stability. Um, so my comments, I will start from the, uh, the literature. I think Dimitri has done a great job in presenting a comprehensive uh, uh, literature. But for me, I think the closest papers uh, to this one uh, is the ones on uh, clearing incentives. So the selection uh, uh, between OTC or CCP when it comes to clearing. Um, so on that one, I think uh, Loreana has, and, uh, and her co-authors has a very interesting paper on the clearing incentives in the sovereign CDS market. Uh, they investigate the, the key factors, uh, which are first the liquidity and riskiness of the reference entity that would uh, uh, that would have impact on the capital requirement and the margin requirement, and then second uh, the credit risk of the counterparty. So that is similar to what the Dimitri is uh, studying here. So whether the most uh, the more risky uh, counterparty would choose to uh, clear via CCP, while the safe ones would uh, go for OTC. And then the third key factor is the clearing member's portfolio uh, net exposure with the CCP. So that is about the netting efficiency. So if the clearing member has higher netting efficiency when joining the CCP, that would push them into the CCP uh, instead of the OTC. So related to that, uh, as an owner and uh, his co-author from uh, CFTC also has a uh, related paper on the impact of unclear margin rule on uh, clearing incentives in uh, non-deliverable forward. So, uh, so basically, the Basel Committee required that uh, for eligible entities, if they are cleared bilaterally, then uh, they have to have uh, uh, they have to uh, impose collateral requirement uh, as high as CCPs. So that is a way to incentivize uh, central clearing. And, uh, and the authors uh, uh, from that paper finds that uh, this rule actually increased clearing rates for MDFs, but only for those ones who are already CCP members. So that shows that there are some uh, uh, frictions in uh, becoming CCP members, at least for the MDF market. Uh, and then uh, they also show that the netting benefits are the main driver for uh, clearing uh, via CCPs. And then also Dimitri uh, mentioned this paper by uh, Angelo Ronaldo and, uh, and uh, his co-authors, so where, where they shows that uh, actually traders with lower counterparty credit risk are more likely to clear via CCP. So I think it's very much an uh, uh, open empirical question about uh, what kind of factors are behind the clearing decisions of the, of the traders. And I think uh, Dimitri's paper uh, provides some interesting evidence uh, on the on the ripple market in uh, in Russia. So then, um, going back to the the, the specific uh, institutional background of this uh, ruble ripple clearing, um, I think compared to the uh, majority of the CCPs nowadays, there are two fundamental differences in this uh, ruble uh, ripple clearing. First is that the membership requirement of the CCP is rather loose, so everyone basically who uh, trade in the ripple market can become a CCP member. So in that sense, the friction of getting uh, of becoming a member of CCP is is rather low. So uh, so that is rather different from uh, from uh, what the, what the uh, other CCPs in major markets nowadays uh, have. And uh, I will I will talk about that later. Um, and then the second thing is that the unclear margin rule, uh, apparently in the in the data sample of Dimitri's paper, is not implemented in uh, in ruble uh, ripple clearing. That's why uh, you will see that uh, in his paper the CCP haircuts are higher than the bilateral ones. 
um, while generally speaking with the UMR in, uh, implemented, the CCP haircuts are generally lower uh, than the bilateral ones. Um, uh, so yeah, so I think um, in the, in the Dimitris paper, the CCP really is an uh, insurance company offering a standardized contract. So in that scenario, indeed, only the risky traders would like to pay for the, or would need to pay for the uh, insurance premium. Um, so only the risky ones uh, would be required to go to the CCP and pay for this uh, uh, higher care cut. Um, but I think, you know, generalizing this result to other uh, major CCPs nowadays uh, could lead to misleading policy implications. Um, so I would be happy here. Uh, first of all, um, yeah, as I have mentioned, the membership requirements nowadays is rather selective. Uh, and the collateral requirement actually can be counterparty dependent. So it's not necessary to be uniform uh, distributed across other parties. Uh, for instance, I think L both LCH and CME, they have a credit add-on uh, for collateral requirement, meaning that, uh, you know, if you are uh, a CCP with uh, uh, a lower credit worthness, then uh, it's possible that your collateral requirement is different from the others, especially in the OTC market. Uh, also, uh, I think you cited uh, uh, John and uh, Linton's paper. Uh, yeah, so basically they also argue that, you know, CCPs are centralized monitors uh, in the sense that uh, the, they are really like monitoring the credit worthness of their memberships. So in that sense, uh, whether the uniform collateral requirement uh, uh, can be generalized, that is, uh, that is a big question. And second of all, uh, yeah, as, as I mentioned, uh, as an honor, uh, his co-authors have shown that, uh, you know, uh, this unclear margin rule really helps with uh, central clearing because it penalizes bilateral clear trades with higher collateral requirements. So I would say that uh, I, I think you have very interesting findings uh, it's more about the exposition of the paper and, uh, you know, about the potential policy uh, implications from the paper uh, that probably, you know, needs some uh, careful wording. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, and uh, because, because the clearing incentives in major markets nowadays could be very different from the results uh, from, uh, of the rubble, rubble clearing. So then my second comment is about uh, the, the regressions. Uh, I think Dimitri, as Dimitri has uh, presented, he has a lot of uh, nice controls in the regressions. However, one thing that I find missing is the impact of netting. Um, as, I, as I just mentioned, uh, in this literature, normally we find that uh, netting is the main uh, driving factor for, uh, for, for central clearing. And also, I mean, Dudley and, uh, and Hao Xiang has, uh, uh, has a, Daryl and Hao Xiang has a very nice paper showing that, you know, the trade-off between multilateral netting, which is the key benefit of central clearing, and the bilateral clearing, which is the key benefit of, um, our, and, and the, and the multi-asset netting, which is the key benefit of uh, bilateral clearing. But so, so I think your data provides that opportunity uh, to, to understand better that uh, whether the increasing popularity of central clearing partly can be due to the uh, benefit of multilateral netting, uh, and also, you know, more importantly for your, uh, for your um, story, uh, does netting really affect uh, traders' clearing decisions in the ruble, uh, ruble market? So controlling that probably would uh, make your results uh, more robust and stronger. And then my final comment is about uh, the missing paradox. I think you have a very catchy title, but I think you need to show more uh, results to convince the readers that uh, the conservative haircut policy could threaten the stability of the CCP. I mean, that's what you have said in the introduction, but um, the current results are solely about clearing incentives, right? So the decisions of whether clear in the CCP or uh, choose for bilateral clearing. So I think you, you have some theoretical arguments in the intro on the trade-off between collateral and default fund. Uh, I think they sound appealing, but uh, I have to be honest, I did not go into the uh, appendix and uh, check all the theoretical results there. Uh, but, my, but I have one key point, or two points. I mean, one, you have already been, uh, you have already touched upon, that is that, you know, higher collateral itself has first order effect in mitigating the counterparty credit risk of the, of the, uh, of the um, uh, traders that fear the CCPs, right? So that is the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that um, 
you know, from the industry practitioners, we hear a lot of arguments about uh, they prefer higher uh, uh, flashbulb requirement, but a lower default fund requirement because exactly because uh, default fund is uh, fungible. So if you are a risk, uh, if you are a safe CC, if you are a safe uh, trader, you would prefer to go to a CCP where uh, the CCP has high collateral requirement and low default fund requirement, so that the risk of your default fund contribution would be used by the others is lower, right? So in that in that uh, uh, in that sense, actually higher collateral requirement should encourage more uh, safe uh, traders into the into the CCP. So that that. Uh, layer of incentives, I think it's not articulated well in the intro. Uh, I think it's also not considered in the in the empirical results because uh, in your empirical results you are comparing uh, just CCP versus the bilateral clear, right? So you are not comparing CCP with, uh, with higher collateral requirement uh, with CCP with lower collateral requirement but higher default fund. And I think for that, uh, yeah, that that is a key thing to to think about in terms of the theory. Um, so. Yeah, and uh, and uh, for me in general, I think it's not really a paradox that the risky traders would need to pay for a higher insurance premium. Um, I see the value uh, of the paper mainly on the clearing incentives, and uh, and um, more on the clearing incentives. I also um, I also yeah, while listening to your to your presentation, I was also wondering like, can you rule out the reverse causality? Uh, from your data set, uh, from your data set, and from your empirical identifications, because you are showing the difference uh, of haircuts between the CCP and the bilateral clear OTC market, right? But then, is it possible that the CCP charge a higher haircut exactly because of the migration of the risky borrowers? Just the uh, the, the example you just mentioned that you know, like, uh, well, you ring the bell of your counterparty, but they actually do not want to. Uh, uh, take your deal with a bilateral clearance. So they said, okay, let's go to the CCP, right? So in your in your uh, data or in your empirical uh, uh, identifications, can you clearly identify an exogenous shock of increase of the CCP haircut that lead to the migration of the risky uh, borrowers? I think, I as far as I recall, I did not see that kind of evidence, and that might be worthwhile to think about. Um, and then I have some minor comments that I can communicate. So, sorry, may I ask you to skip it? <laughs> exactly, Thank you. I can communicate offline. So, yeah, thanks a lot for, uh, for the paper. I really enjoy reading it. So thank you very much, Wenyang. Thank you. So we're already uh, over time, but of course I want to uh, give uh, Dimitri the possibility to reply quickly to some of the comments of the discussant. And actually then there is one question in the chat. So, Dimitri. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, it was It was a great discussion. I'm super grateful for all the comments and uh, also, yeah, also for uh, the literature that you recommended that uh, two out of three papers that uh, you put, yes, indeed, I overlooked and I need to have a look at them to see how, how much uh, they have covered of what I say. Uh, then let me start from uh, from the end because I think the most important comment was the last one about the reverse causality. Um, indeed, I don't identify one single shock. It's not in that terms, but um, uh, you're absolutely right. First of all, that in the long run, the haircuts and uh, uh, the um, kind of the composition of borrowers they are jointly determined. But on the collateral month level. It is very hard for the CCP to readjust it on collateral month level um, as a res as a response to the changes in uh, in the credit risk of the borrowers uh, because it just first of all the its its methodology doesn't give this flexibility and uh, um, even if it tried this will completely uh, antagonize the market participants they don't like to have these changes in an unpredictable way so this methodology is actually it, it's basically reacting to the, to the volatility. This uh, haircut can go up uh, on a daily basis, can go up today, and in two days it can go down. Um, and uh, it cannot mechanically it cannot react to the uh, to uh, to the quality of participants, but it can in general the CCP can make the methodology more conservative, for example. But of course not on the collateral month basis. In this sense, I'm using the 
quote-unquote high-frequency variation as plausibly exogenous to the actions of the CCP. Now, uh, I, uh, I totally agree that uh, about the comment on the difference in, uh, uh, in the um, kind of in the structure and the um, and the, the rules in the market in, the, in in the major markets like in Europe and the US versus uh, the market in Russia. Uh, the question is whether it is always go, going to be the same or whether uh, there will be uh, more voices for opening access to uh, different market participants to the centralized clearing because as we have seen in a paper presenting a year ago on the same symposium, it can uh, affect, it can amplify the, um, uh, it can amplify the, uh, um, the uh, past through of the monetary policy. I think Yimin uh, was presenting a paper, uh, this paper a year ago, right? So uh, then, of course, we will we will have to also uh, change probably this uh, the way these credit add-ons work because well, uh, these credit add-ons can actually amplify the procyclicality on the individual level. Uh, I, I had a conversation with the uh, with the market participants that were actually very much afraid of this introduction because imagine a bank becomes a bit riskier, and now apart from all the consequences of this event, also the now the collateral requirement in the CCP market is higher. So even the last resort, the CCP market is, is punishing for high credit risk. So actually participants were afraid of this. So it is not sh certain how this will change in the future. I think it's an interesting example that can tell us what will happen if the policy mm, kind of changes that direction. Um, then, um, I totally agree that I have to do a more work on the missing, what you call the missing paradox, right? To see that, to, to really show that this is not the secondary effect. Even, but think about it, even if it is the secondary effect, it will, it will change, uh, it, it has to change the way kind of the sensitivity that we, we think about, uh, right? So uh, then probably we need to increase, if we think about increasing a haircut, we know that there is an effect that goes the opposite way, probably we need to increase it a bit more. Right, so even if it were the second order effect, we need to take it into account. But of course, I uh, I have a lot of plans to do more with the model that I have, and uh, yeah, I think I'm a bit over time. I will respond to all other uh, comments as well. I have a response, and uh, I would like to ask you to to send me the presentation and also probably to have a bit more of this discussion offline. Uh, thank you once again very much for your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. So in the chat, there is a question that you may have partly answered already, but OK, I'm reading it. So uh, can I ask two clarifying question? How often the CCP change haircut levels? I guess my guess is that this is a question related to your data, because I mean, mm -hmm. okay, of course, the, we discuss about this, that there may be a big differences. Mm -hmm. And how quickly does haircut change in response to changes in market conditions? So the CCP haircut uh, changes like literally during the day. If there is a spike in volatility, it can go uh, it can go up within the day, just in the middle of it, and then it will uh, it will uh, be on this level for some time, and then it will go down. So uh, it is quite responsive in the CCP market. Of course, in the OTC market, it takes time. To a bit of time to rewatch it and so on, but uh, uh, also the, CC, the OTC market is also responsive to this. So uh, with this, I would like to close the conference because we are already ten minutes over time and it's late for some people. Uh, thank you very much. I think it was very very interesting session. I learned a lot. Uh, both papers were very interesting, and thanks a lot for the discussion. You did a great job. And of course, to all the panelists and to all the participants, the conference uh, will take place also tomorrow afternoon. Uh, there is going to be two great sessions. We're going to talk about central bank reserves and payments, and there will be uh, also a panel of market participants that also is very interesting. So see you tomorrow. Have a great night. Have a good rest of the day. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.